And um, we, as, as we were starting to gather tonight, uh, uh, different of us have noticed that uh, there's some kind of, I don't know, national event going on next Tuesday and Tuesday night. Uh, and and really? I, I, <laughs> yeah, imagine. Um, so I think I have told you sometime in the course of this class earlier that I'm, my dad was a history and government teacher, and so I'm kind of a politics junkie. I have been known to stay up until 1 a.m. watching the BBC website for British election returns, you know, so uh, I'm, uh, but having said that, I just want to tell you, I'm going to be here next Tuesday night at 630 and I'm going to teach about Romans. <laughs> oh. and if none of you show up, we'll record it and you'll get the recording. <laughs> and, We'll be done by eight, and I think there'll probably still be some election news left to come in from eight o'clock on, if you care to join us. But uh, either way, uh, that's, uh, as, as always, that's your call. But uh, I just wanted you to know, uh, I will be here next week. Class will not be called off. And um, so live or, or on tape, as they say, uh, you'll be able to get that. Can so, we say an extra prayer tonight for that? <laughs> yeah, let's let's do say an extra prayer for that. Um, In Pennsylvania, we may not be getting the election results until the following Tuesday, so yeah, I'll be here. Yeah. yeah, you guys are you guys are getting a lot of publicity these days. Yeah, now uh, they're going to go to the Supreme Court again, so I'm not sure what will happen there. Yeah, my I, I I was able to verify online that my advance ballot has been processed and and uh, recorded. So me too. <laughs> That was nice here in Kansas. Um, yeah, are you able to say, uh, did that mean it was counted? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I think in Kansas yeah, they yeah. are able to count them. Some states. Yeah, because mine, 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 mine yeah. have been counted, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, and also uh, I'm, I'm going to mention uh, tonight, and I, I want to remind you, if, uh, if any of you have a specific prayer requests that you'd like the group to to pray for, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat and uh, Katie will be sure to, uh, to note those and uh, send them to me so that we can email them uh, to all of you so that we can be a community in prayer. My brother-in-law, John, who lives in New Mexico, had surgery a week or so ago on his leg, but his uh, incision apparently got infected. So yesterday morning, I got a text from my sister saying that uh, they were back in Albuquerque, back in the, he was back in the hospital, and, uh, and oh, no. uh, Mexico is one of the states that's having a surge of COVID-19 cases right now, and so the hospital was quite crowded. Uh, they had to wait until this afternoon to get an operating room where he could uh, get his uh, infection area drained and, and so on, so um, uh, he's trying to rest in the hospital tonight. His last text tells me that his roommate talks very loudly on his cell phone, so that makes it harder to rest. So anyway, if, if you would uh, be willing to keep my brother-in-law, John, and my sister, Carolyn, in your prayers, they're going through kind of a disrupted time. And they had big snow in Albuquerque today, too. Uh, I, some, I, I, I often joke, you, you local folks may recognize this, I often joke that Kansas City is the northernmost southern city in the country because bad weather just freaks out an awful lot of Kansas City drivers <laughs> and uh, and so on but um, but uh, listening to my sister's account I think Albuquerque is even worse because it really is a southwestern city <laughs> and uh, people aren't very very confident uh, in handling snow on the roads so anyway, uh, if others of you have prayer requests for us, like I say, please uh, put them in the chat and we will send them out to the entire group so that we can be in prayer for one another. So in, in the meantime, let's uh, bow our heads now and, and uh, start with a word of prayer. Lord God, in uh, this week's reading in the second half of Acts, we read about the city of Ephesus getting all upset because the Apostle Paul's preaching was disturbing their trade in silver statues of their goddess uh, uh, Diana or um, Artemis. And um, we read about Roman authorities uh, and uh, Jewish authorities putting Paul through trials where they already knew the verdict they wanted. And a lot of things that, um, that strike echoes, that remind us that uh, 
in the world we live in, uh, things have never worked in total harmony and as smoothly as you'd like. And our country is going through a time of tension and uncertainty as our presidential election approaches in another week. And yes, we all hope and pray that your spirit will be at work in our land. And um, here at Resurrection, we've been busily putting out signs in all of the roadways that carry all the political signs. And we've been putting out love your neighbor and love is kind signs to try to make that our campaign motto. And, uh, and so just send your spirit, Lord, and, and uh, bless our country and watch over it. And uh, as much as we are open to it, please draw out what Abraham Lincoln long ago called the better angels of our nature. And tonight, uh, guide and, and teach us as we study about uh, this remarkable man, Paul, who you called to be your sort of spearhead leader, your mission leader to the Gentile world. And my, how he carried out that task. Uh, help us to learn from him and to be inspired by his example and uh, to be energized by your presence with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, let me get my screen up here to share with you. Hello. Our Bible study is called Conversion Tonight because it deals with uh, what happened as Paul traveled around the Roman world. But last week, of course, we did uh, the first half of the biblical book of Acts. Uh, and we noted that um, it's not just a simple standalone book. It's volume two of the book we call the Gospel of Luke. It's written by the same writer and it's dedicated to the same um, patron, I guess you could call him, Theophilus. And uh, so it begins by telling us, uh, again, if you took the time to read the last uh, little, last, se last several verses of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and then the first verses of Acts, you may have even noted a little bit of overlap there. Uh, Jesus has been raised from the dead, and now he, he's meeting with his disciples, and he gave them a mission. He said, I, you are to be my witnesses uh, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the whole world. And he gave them a promise that was important to the carrying out of that mission. He said, you're to wait in Jerusalem until you receive power. And that was in the Greek, that's the word dunamis, which is the root word behind our English word dynamite. So it wasn't just like a little, little squibbed firecracker. It, it was like, this is gonna be serious power. And we saw last week that the promise came true on the day of Pentecost, which was just 50 days after Jesus' trial and crucifixion. And the same disciples who were cowering in fear when the authorities came and arrested Jesus and condemned him to death now we're marching out boldly into the streets and preaching, this is the Jesus you, you crucified, but he was the Messiah God had promised us. And God raised him from the dead and you need to repent. And they were so persuasive and so convic convicting that 3,000 people joined the church, uh, it says, on the day of Pentecost, on that first uh, day after the Holy Spirit arrived. Just a remarkable, remarkable turnaround. As the story went on, uh, tension arose between the Greeks and the Hebrews, uh, people with Greek and Hebrew backgrounds in the Jerusalem church. They appointed deacons, and one of those deacons was a man named Stephen. And he was not only a, he had not only a servant's heart, but he was a, a, a speaker himself, a, a compelling uh, preacher of the good news of Jesus. And he got in, got called before the Jewish council and he preached Jesus so powerfully that they became furious. He, he went over Israel's history, but he didn't do it to tell them, you're, you're God's special people, you're the most awesome people ever. He said, you know, you, you keep missing the point and you keep killing the prophets. And, and they were furious and they, they hauled him out of there. 
and, and stoned him to death right outside of town with a young Pharisee named Saul holding their coats and assenting, agreeing that they were doing the right thing in killing Stephen. Um, and yet that young Pharisee named Saul, then full of vigor and zeal, got, uh, got the high priest to give him letters, sending him up to Damascus in Syria to arrest Christians and haul them back to Jerusalem to be jailed and maybe tried and maybe executed. And, uh, and yet on that road, this bright light shone down and Saul met Jesus. Uh, we, he talked about it several times in, his, in, in Acts and in his letters and he never treated it as like, oh, I just had this vision or something. It, it was like, no, I met Jesus on the road to Damascus and, um, and, and turned his life around completely. Not, we mentioned last week, we simply call it the conversion of Paul. He was not converted from being like a drunk in the gutter. He was already absolutely on fire to serve God. But what it did was it completely transformed his understanding of what it meant to serve God. And instead of opposing Jesus and trying to stomp him out and his followers out, uh, he became the preeminent preacher of Jesus to the Gentile world. And he changed from using his Hebrew name Saul to using his Greek name Paul. And we know him as the Apostle Paul, uh, the great apostle, especially to the Gentiles. And, and the other leading apostle um, in many ways, Peter, also had a remarkable vision where God showed him a sheet full of animals that were unclean under the, under the laws of Leviticus. And he said, hey, Peter, take and eat. And Peter said, I, I can't do that. I don't eat those things. And, and this is repeated three times. And God, at the end of it, says to him, listen, don't call unclean what I have called clean. And Peter's like, God, you know, eat lizard and shrimp. But that wasn't the point. Because as soon as the third vision had ended, there was a knock on Peter's door, and it was a bunch of Romans. Right. Welcome to Northeast Tech. And they had been sent by, a, by, a, by their centurion to get Peter because he'd had a vision, and God said, go send this, get this man Peter and have him come and preach to you. And so Peter went and met with these Romans and wasn't sure about this. They, that wasn't didn't feel like the kind of thing a good Jew should be doing, but he preached to them and God poured out the Holy Spirit on them and Peter went back home to Jerusalem and some of the other Christians were critical of him. Why'd you go preach to the Romans? He says, God told me to, and look, he poured out the Holy Spirit on them. And so, you know, their horizons were being expanded by God, whether they wanted them expanded or not. Uh, a Christian center formed to the north in Antioch in Syria and Paul and Barnabas went and spent time there, and then they sent them out. And so Paul traveled and planted churches in what we now call his first missionary journey and had some remarkable experiences, but he was just not to be denied. And as he finished that, and it was obvious that a lot of Gentiles were coming into the church, uh, a controversy arose. Uh, over the issue of uh, circumcision, because in Genesis 17, the Hebrew tradition said every male who's going to be a faithful servant of God has to be circumcised. Um, I, my dad was a high school Bible teacher, and he used to tell us that he always kind of dreaded coming to this part of the Bible story because he taught a freshman Bible class and he, he, he said practically every year, some sweet, wide-eyed, innocent little freshman girl, many times her father was an influential preacher in the conference or something, would hold up her hand and say, Pastor Holtz, what is circumcision? And my father had gotten a lot of experience with this, and so he would always reply, ask your mother. Um, but... Um, there was controversy about this in the early Christian church. And some people were saying, no, those Gentiles have to follow the same laws we, we Jews have always followed. So they met in Jerusalem. 
And James, uh, who was the brother of Jesus, presided and they decided, and we'll summarize this again in the next slide, they decided that the Gentiles would not have to obey all of those Old Testament laws, that that would be too much of an obstacle and that the real essence of what, uh, what they were preaching was that Jesus was the savior and, and faith in him was the central reality that needed to be emphasized. So that was the first half of Acts. This week, we're gonna look at the second half. Any questions or observations you bring with you to class uh, from, your, from any reading you might've done this week? I have a possibly a silly question. Oh, um, there were no silly questions in Disciple One, Carolyn. Um, when he's Paul is doing his defense in like twenty four on Felix, uh -huh. the verse says that Felix understood the way. Is it being sarcastic or is it being serious? Um, I, it didn't seem like he understood. But then it said it, he did. Well, I think, I think the way I've always understood it, at least I'll say is, I think what Luke is trying to say is, Felix wasn't completely in the dark about what Paul was talking about. He knew there were, he knew there were people out there who followed this Jesus. He knew that, that they somehow were sort of related to the Jewish faith, but not exactly. They were kind of different. So I think, that's at least how I've always understood Luke's phrase that he knew about the way that he, he, he had some information. He wasn't starting completely from ground zero, but no, yeah. he wasn't, he certainly wasn't a believer. Yeah. Right, thank you. So, so yeah, that, that's, uh, I think what Luke was trying to convey to us. Okay. Anybody else? Daryl? Yes. Um, your screen sharing, are you meaning to uh, share the PowerPoint? Um, the, the questions and observations, the slides? Yeah. It's normal for me. Is, is it looking It's normal weird? for me. It's you can fine. see the slide? Yeah, I just see the slide like a normal week. Huh, strange, because I see you, Daryl. That's okay. I just was well, curious. Well, sometimes I'm, I'm up there in the corner. <laughs> at, well, let me the, check. I'll see if it's my setting. You don't, you don't have the slide at all? Nope. Oh, that's okay. I'll check my setting. Okay. Yeah, I think there is a some kind of a you know speaker view or something that you can. Set. Okay. So I hope. Okay. You can no worries. It. If everybody else has got it, then we'll just figure it out. Okay. Well, thanks for mentioning it though, because you never know when it might have been on my end. All right. Well, very good then. Let's. Uh, Let's dive in. We got a lot of ground to cover, almost literally tonight, because we got two missionary voyages plus a trip to Rome to cover. So the human condition statement for this lesson says, we are uncomfortable witnessing about our faith to strangers and people of different religions. Even with our families and next door neighbors, we hesitate to talk about God. We suspect that people will resent ideas that challenge their beliefs or customs. And they always put these little snappers. Besides, we're not sure we would want them to join us. That's, um, that's certainly a, a challenging uh, attitude to the extent that we might have it. Um, so like, as I was saying, last week we ended with what we call the Jerusalem Council. They met to settle this circumcision issue. James, Jesus' brother, the leader in Jerusalem, ruled in Acts 15 that Gentile converts did not have to obey all of the Old Testament rules and specifically did not have to obey the rules about male circumcision. Um, and they wrote a letter and uh, addressed it to all of the Gentile converts, kind of a general letter. Um, they didn't have, you know, email or any of those vehicles to send it out, but I'm sure they must have made several copies. And, and we're told in Acts 15, then after the council, that Barnabas and Paul uh, took a copy of the letter back to the Christian community in Antioch in Syria, and that the people read the letter and were delighted with its encouraging message. So this was an important step forward for the early Christian church. Uh, had they decided to, to go the other way, they probably would have become kind of a, a smaller subsect of the existing Jewish faith. 
um, some people who maybe believed in Jesus, others who didn't, uh, but they, they certainly would not have been as uh, effective at rapidly reaching a large number of Gentile people because there would have been a lot of uh, resistance to, to adopting those rules. So having taken that back, uh, Paul says to Barnabas, let's go back to the, to the churches that we raised on our first missionary journey. Let's go back and see how they're doing. And Acts tells us Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them. Now, last week when we went over that first missionary journey, we noted that they got uh, through the island of Crete and over onto the mainland of, of Asia Minor of what today is mostly modern Turkey. And then uh, one of the first cities they went to, uh, John Mark left them. He, he apparently got homesick or scared or something and left them. So now they're getting ready to go on another trip and Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them. John Mark was a relative of his. But Paul insisted they shouldn't take him along since he had deserted them. Paul's like, I don't need any quitters on these trips. Come on, we're, this is serious business, you know, and, and uh, I want my team to be there with me. And, um, and so uh, this is pretty remarkable. Here are these two great kind of founders of the faith. Barnabas actually was the one uh, when Paul was first won to Jesus who uh, you know, the Jerusalem Christians, Paul had been persecuting them. So they were like, they, they weren't sure they wanted anything to do with him. And Barnabas was the one who took Paul kind of under his wing and, and said, vouched for him and said, no, really, believe me, he's now, a, a, he's now one of us. He's now a believer. And all of this, the, this is a close relationship. But their argument became so intense that they went their separate ways. They disagreed about this, this question of, you know, should we take John Mark with us or not so strongly that they, you know, Barnabas stuck with his, his insistence. Uh, no, John Mark's grown up. He's better. And so Barnabas takes John Mark and he goes to the island of Cyprus and Paul chooses another young man named Silas and he takes him north into the province of Galatia. Um, and this is this is one of the neat things about acts it doesn't in any way uh sugarcoat the fact that there was this disagreement even between these two devout devoted christians but when they when barnabas and paul disagreed with each other one of the cool things is and i had a teacher years ago point this out instead of staying there in antioch and writing pamphlets about how the other guy was wrong and criticizing each other they just resolved it in such a way that the early church now had two evangelistic teams instead of just one. And that would, that, so they, you know, again, to use a common phrase, they, they took the lemon and they made lemonade out of it and they made a good thing come out of even their disagreement. And so uh, Paul sets out on uh, now what we call his second missionary journey. So here's a map that'll help us follow it. And, and in the first stages of this trip, uh, he went through the province of Galatia. Now this area here, again, it was uh, the, the whole area was called Asia Minor, but within it, there was this Roman province called Galatia. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to read the letter to the Galatians, which is one of the earliest letters Paul wrote. And so as background, it's important to know that was not just to one city, that was to all of the churches in this province. Um, and, um, and so that was uh, the language, the, the designation that the Romans had used. Uh, they, they appear to have gone maybe even through Tarsus, which was the city where Paul had been born. They go back to Derby, which is one of the cities. They go back to Lystra. Now that's kind of remarkable. Uh, because uh, Lystra, of course, is the city in the first missionary journey where Paul was stoned and dragged out of the city, and they thought they'd killed him. They left him lying outside of the city, thinking they were leaving him for dead. And without giving a lot of explanation, Luke just says when the disciples gathered around him, he stood up and walked back in the city and, and went on with his missionary journey. So he goes back to that city again. And in that city, of all places, Paul met a young man named Timothy. And we read about that in Acts 16. And um, Timothy becomes, I mean, we have ultimately in our New Testament, two letters addressed to Timothy. Uh, and he gets a lot of other mentions uh, as we go on through the book of Acts. He becomes 
probably the closest thing to a son that the Apostle Paul ever had. Um, Paul is, uh, we, have, we have no direct evidence that Paul was ever married or had any children, uh, but Timothy and he uh, form a very close relationship. And so uh, he adds Timothy to the missionary team. And so now he's got, uh, you know, at least uh, Silas and Timothy with him. And then uh, as we get to Acts 16, 6, uh, we, we read, and again, Luke doesn't get real specific, but Paul is up here and, and he seems to have kind of had the idea that he wanted to go over this way to, to raise up some churches over in this area. But Luke just says the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him. And he doesn't really tell us how that happened. Did, you know, did his airline reservations keep getting canceled or you know, what was it that he just says the, the Holy Spirit didn't let him. So, and so, you know, Paul kind of keeps going, uh, but not quite sure what's going on until he ends up over here in the coastal city of Troas. And here in the coastal city of Troas, he has a dream at night. And the dream says, he sees a man standing there and the man is beckoning to him and he says, come over to Macedonia and help us. And until that time, Paul's basic vision seems to have been, I want to preach here to Gentiles, but Macedonia was over here. Macedonia was a part of the, the Greek peninsula. It was a whole kind of different part of the Roman Empire across the Aegean Sea. And, and so Paul has this vision of this man saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, one interesting feature of the book of Acts is that it, as Luke is writing in Acts 16, 6 about Paul and his companions trying to go up into the Asian area, but not being allowed to, uh, he says they, they, they tried to do this, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let them do it. Then Paul has this dream in Troas saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And in Acts 16, 10, we read, we set out to go over to Macedonia. So Luke has joined the group here in Troas. Uh, it's not now them, it's, it's we. And so Luke is, a, is an active part of this piece of the journey. But this is, this is a big deal, see, because this expands the Christian message from being sort of in the uh, extreme Eastern part of the Roman Empire now, all of a sudden, it's moving on to the European continent. Rome is over here. The, the boot of Italy is over here. But, uh, but Greece, you know, had been the world empire under Alexander the Great before Rome arose. And it was still a highly influential part of, of the, the European civilization. And so this is like a major expansion of the impact of the Christian mission to say, oh, we aren't going to limit ourselves just to, to the Asian area. We're going to go over uh, into Macedonia and, um, and on down to Greece. So uh, the first place they go is a Roman colony city called Philippi. And uh, we just, uh, you know, had, had sermons at the church about Paul's letter to the Philippians. Um, Philippi was a Roman colony city, which meant it had a lot of retired Roman soldiers in it uh, and not that many Jews. So although the general practice that we see for Paul was that when he went to a new city, he'd go into the synagogue and preach first to the Jews and try to convince them that Jesus was the Messiah. And then if they rejected him or when he felt like he'd reached as many as he could there, he'd go out and preach to the Gentiles. In Philippi, he didn't find a synagogue. Uh, you had to have 10 adult Jewish men to form a synagogue, and apparently they didn't have that many. But he went out by the river and found a place where women would gather to pray and preach to Jesus, preached about Jesus to them. And one convert uh, and a woman who was uh, quite uh, prosperous uh, offered her house as a place for the church to meet. And so uh, Philippi uh, actually became, the Philippians became a strong supportive church. And uh, the evidence in the letter to the Philippians says that, uh, you know, Paul was very grateful to these people and, and they offered him uh, active support at, very, at a number of different times during his ministry. So that was, that was a very good stop in, in Philippi. So then they moved on from Philippi 
and uh, kind of down the road just a little ways to Thessalonica. And they made some converts in Thessalonica, but there that he was preaching in the synagogue and the Jewish leaders of the synagogue didn't like the fact that some of their people were following what Paul was preaching and, and joining this new Christian group. So they made trouble for Paul, and kind of stirred up uh, a riot. And, um, and so he moved on from there to a city named Berea. Uh, now, Berea is probably more familiar to many of us than, um, than it was maybe even in the ancient world. It doesn't seem to have been a major city. And yet, um, if, if, you, if you've been around church life at all, you know there's a lot of Berean churches or Berean Bible churches uh, scattered around in the Christian world. It, 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 and, and the reason for that is that the way Luke describes the people of Berea uh, in Acts chapter 16, um, and, and actually, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. I've given you the wrong reference there on the slide. So it's Acts 17. Uh, and in Acts 17, 11, um, he says, you know, they sent Paul and Silas on to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. The Berean Jews were more honorable than those in Thessalonica. This was evident in the great eagerness with which they accepted the word and examined the scriptures each day to see whether Paul and Silas teaching was true. And so when you hear a church that calls itself the Berean church, it's based on Acts 17, 11, not 16, 11. Um, and, and the fact that uh, these people studied the Bible for themselves and, and didn't just take the preacher's word for it, but listened carefully and then went home and studied the scriptures um, to, to make sure that this was uh, the straight teaching. So that's kind of a cool note. Eventually, the synagogue authorities in Berea also made trouble for Paul. And so concerned for his safety, the uh, Christians in Thessalonica and Berea, they kept Timothy and Silas with them for a while, but they sent Paul on by himself all the way down the peninsula to Athens. Well, Athens, you know, was a big deal. Athens was, if you want to use sports terminology, Athens was the major leagues. This was the capital of, of the Greek empire. This was a preeminent center of learning in the ancient world. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, I, I, I tell people that these cities in the ancient world, if, they, if, if you try to look for American equivalents, you know, Rome was Washington, D.C. It was all politics all the time. Um, and uh, we'll talk about Corinth in a minute. But, but Athens was, was kind of more like Boston, you know, where there's Harvard and dozens of other universities, it seems like. Uh, Athens was, was a, a real center of learning and, and philosophy. So Paul gets to Athens and he's by himself, so he's kind of wandering around town, but he's talking to people because this is Paul and, and he's gonna tell them about Jesus. And he ends up being ordered to Mars Hill uh, in Athens. And again, I've got, it's chapter 17. I got my chapters wrong on this slide, I apologize. Um, and and the, when I say he was ordered to Mars Hill, if you read what Luke says about it, he doesn't, it doesn't just say they invited him. He says they took him into custody and took him to Mars Hill. So the, the philosophers and, and the people of authority in Athens kind of forcefully said to this foreigner who was wandering around there, listen, you're, gonna, you're not going to just wander the streets and talk about this. You're going to come to Mars Hill where all our philosophers meet, and you're going to tell them what this is about. So Paul gets invited up to, to Mars Hill, and he preaches this superb sermon on Mars Hill. And it's, it's really one, I think, that, that we can learn from. Because here he is in a city where, as far as we know, there were basically no Christians. And now kind of their, their philosophical ruler group on Mars Hill has asked him to speak. But he doesn't go up there and say, you guys are a bunch of pagans and boy, are you immoral and, and so on. No, he, he has this very respectful tone. He says, I, I've been looking around your city and I can see that you are very religious people. 
I mean, look at, the, look at all the temples you have here. Again, these were Greeks. They didn't believe in one God. They believed in all these different gods up on Mount Olympus. Um, and they had lots of temples. He says, I even found a temple dedicated to an unknown God. And this is an interesting thing. Archaeologists have found these in various ancient Greek cities. The idea seems to have been, okay, we know about Zeus and we know about Hermes and we know about Apollo and, and, you know, and, and so on. But what if there's a God that we haven't identified yet? What if there's a God we don't know about? These gods are very powerful. They can cause us a lot of trouble. Uh, there's a fundamental difference between the Jewish and Christian faith and all of these pagan faiths in the ancient world. They didn't believe that their gods loved them and wanted what was good for them. They, you know, they saw the gods as powerful beings who could cause them all kinds of problems. I haven't had a chance to watch this new series on, on uh, Amazon Prime called The Boys, but it may have a little bit of that attitude. The, the previews I've seen suggest that these are you know, like superheroes who don't care about human beings. They, they, you know, accidentally run over people and cause them all kinds of difficulty. Well, that was kind of the way the Greeks saw their gods. Uh, and so the temple to the unknown God see is like, well, even if there's a God that we haven't identified yet, he could cause us problems. So we better build a temple and go ahead and offer sacrifices there just to stay on the good side, even of that unknown God. Paul finds this. He starts from that and says to them, okay, that unknown God that you built that temple to, I'm here to tell you about that God. See, so he takes something that creates common ground with the, with the Greeks who are listening to him. And as he goes on to expound that, so that he says, you know, I'm here to talk about the God who created the world and, and the God who sustains the world. In him, we live and move and have our being, he says. And he's quoting a pagan writer's phrase. I, I think that uh, somebody who's a greater scholar of ancient Greece said that that actually in the in the Greek writing that was about the god Zeus but Paul says no 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 this is this is actually about this god I'm telling you about the god who made the whole world um, and he quotes also from uh, from another pagan poet so he shows familiarity with their culture and he speaks to them in respectful tones but tells them this god who made the world came among us in Jesus Christ and he died and he rose from the dead. And, and that's kind of like the ultimate sign that this is the real God that you need to be paying attention to. And at that point, Luke says, some of those Greek philosophers were like, well, that's interesting. But others of them were like, oh, no, no, no. We don't buy this business of somebody rising from the dead. Uh-uh. We, come on. We're not gullible. We're not stupid. We know that doesn't happen. And so they kind of sent Paul away and said, we, you know, maybe we'll call for you another time and listen to you. So then Luke tells us that he made some converts in Athens, that there, that when he left there, there were no Christians in the city of Athens. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, there were some of them who were just too smart and too sophisticated to, to buy this, this story of, of uh, Jesus who rose from the dead. Well, from Athens then, um, after his companions were able to come and join him, Paul moved on to the city of Corinth. Now, it's hard to tell on this little map, and, and we'll be talking, we'll, we'll read 1 Corinthians in a couple of weeks, and I'll have a more detailed map. Corinth was a uniquely situated place because it's, it's set on this very narrow little eight-mile-wide neck of land. And even on this map, you can see out here, you've got the, the Ionian Sea, and down here's the Mediterranean. And if you were sailing, and it was kind of dangerous to sail, especially at some times of year, if you were sailing to go over here, and you were coming from here, you had to sail clear around the Achaean Peninsula, except there was this waterway that went right up here to this eight-mile-wide neck of land, and Corinth was built right on that neck of land. So if you could sail your ship up here, they had figured out a way to get ships across that eight mile neck. They could save you all that dangerous sailing out there in the open sea. So Corinth was this very, very prosperous seaport town because they saved sailors a lot of money and a lot of danger. It was also a notoriously immoral town because 
uh, as a seaport town, uh, it, it was always full of sailors on shore leave. And, and it had one particular temple dedicated to the Greek goddess of love, Aphrodite. Um, and there were, they called them priestesses of the temple of Aphrodite who every evening came into the town and collected quote unquote offerings from the sailors on shore leave and anybody else who wanted to give them an offering um, for the, the temple of the goddess. And in return for the offerings, they provided sexual favors. Uh, Corinth was so notoriously immoral that the Romans in their, in their uh, talking about their empire had actually coined a verb to describe somebody who lived a wildly immoral life, they said he was Corinthianizing. So the, the city of Corinth was actually a part of the language uh, as a way to describe immoral behavior. So here comes Paul into this city, which in some ways, you know, if you, if you just say, okay, where's gonna be prime territory to plant a Christian church? You're like, well, probably not Corinth, my goodness. I, I, you know, I said Rome is Washington, D.C., Athens is Boston. I think Corinth is kind of like New Orleans. You know, it's, it's just kind of famous for being a sort of wide open town with all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Um, but in fact, uh, Paul ended up staying in Corinth for 18 months, a year and a half, much longer than he stayed in most of the places where he went and planted churches. And he won a lot of people to faith in Jesus. So that, in fact, our New Testament contains two letters that he wrote to, to these Christian communities. Remember, nobody built big churches. There were no, there were no you know, massive sanctuaries that seated 3,000 people in New Testament times. These were mostly house churches, so there must have been a whole bunch of them scattered around Corinth. And... Um, and, and Paul wrote two different letters to them. And actually, in those letters, refers to other letters he wrote to them. So he probably wrote them at least four letters. And again, we, we won't uh, go into detail about them tonight because we'll be, be studying 1 Corinthians in a couple of weeks. But, uh, but this was an important stop for him. Uh, like I say, he ended up spending 18 months there and ended up having a big impact and, and converting a whole lot of people uh, to faith in Jesus. So that was a, a really good, good thing. Uh, from Corinth, then he, he actually apparently caught a boat and sailed back across to the city of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was an important city in this area. He didn't stay long on this voyage. He did come back later. We'll talk about that when we get to his third missionary voyage. Uh, but he stayed long enough, and, and Ephesus also became, uh, according to Christian tradition, the city where the Apostle John uh, went and settled after he left Jerusalem. Uh, and so back when I told you about the Christmas story, uh, I think it was probably on the next time that he was in Ephesus where Paul spent, um, I believe about three years there, that Luke was with him and may have gone and, and met Mary who was staying with John and, and gotten his Christmas story. Anyway, so there he is. And, and the, so then from there, uh, he takes ship and goes back to Jerusalem. Uh, to touch base uh, with the apostles there and, and just give them a report. Uh, now, before we move on to that part of the story, though, we've got to, this week, part of our reading assignment included a letter that later Paul wrote to the Ephesians, the letter to the Christians in the city of Ephesus. And uh, this is a six-chapter letter. It's not super long. Um, and it's uh, it's a really lovely letter to read in many ways. It's very warm. It's very reflective. There doesn't seem to have been any specific crisis in the church. A lot of times when Paul wrote these letters, it was because he'd heard about a problem. Certainly when we uh, read Galatians, that'll be the case. Certainly when we read Corinthians, they were having a lot of issues, a lot of questions. Uh, but if Ephesians isn't so much, you guys are in trouble. It, it was just, hey, I, I love you, and uh, you're a great church, and and I want to affirm for you how much God cares about you and, and the great things God has in mind for you. And so in Ephesians 1.5, Paul used an image that he also would use in a number of his other letters that, that is a significant image. He 
talks about us as being God's adopted children. And so this is one of the several images that he used to try to express what God had done for us in Jesus. Jesus was, so to speak, you know, God's, by natural means, a part of God's family. We were not, we were rebels. We were, you know, estranged from God, but God has adopted us into his family. This is one, this is an image that's always spoken to me because um, I was kind of tough on my mother when I was born and she couldn't have any more children that way. And so uh, when we were in Brazil, my parents adopted my sister uh, and um, got her when she was three days old. And she's just always been a part of our family ever since. You know, so that's what Paul was saying about us. We were adopted by God, not to be his servants, not to be his slaves, to be his children. And, and he made us part of the family. And, and in chapter two of Ephesians, he, he, he writes that beautiful passage about how we were, we were lost. We didn't quite know how to find our way to God, but God reached out to us and God saved us, not because we were so terrific. God saved us by his grace, by his goodness. And he calls salvation God's gift to us. Uh, it's it's not something we earned. It's not something that we, you know, it's like, well, check that off, boy, I, I finally got my pay. No, it's God's gift to us. God is the one who, whose idea it was. But then he also addresses the fact that, you know, there, there were these people with Jewish backgrounds and there were these people with, with Greek backgrounds in the church. And he talks about, he says, Christ is our peace because he made both Jews and Gentiles into one group. And he broke down the barrier of hatred that divided us. And, and that was a really important thing for the Apostle Paul. Uh, we'll see in, in, in his third missionary voyage, he was trying, he was looking for tangible ways to get both the Gentiles and the Jewish people to understand they were part of one family. They were not two rival groups. They were part of one family and God had extended grace to both of them through Jesus. And, and so he says, you know, he, he, he took down those ethnic barriers that separated us from each other. And, and this is one of the ways that, that Ephesians, frankly, I think can speak to us in our situation in our country right now. There are some ethnic and racial barriers that uh, exist, but uh, even among people of the same ethnic group, there are political barriers. And if I like, you know, if I have one view of government and you have a different view, uh, sometimes uh, that becomes a barrier of hatred. And again, the purpose of the gospel, Paul said, was to break down those barriers and to unite us with one another. And so then Ephesians went on to talk about how God's plan was to do all of this through the church. And, and the church at that time was not a place that had a formal headquarters anywhere or, you know, lots of the structures that now we associate with the church. It was just, the Greek word was ekklesia, and it meant an assembly. It meant people gathering together. And that was the fundamental thing that, that Paul was saying to them was, you are a part of God's big plan for the world. Uh, that's part of what I love about being part of Church of the Resurrection is Pastor Adam talks about our vision. We want to change the world for the better. We're not alone in that. There are lots of Christian churches that are working on that, but that, that's what Ephesians taught. And in Ephesians 4, Paul said he gives each believer gifts to equip them to do the work that he has, uh, has called them to do. And um, uh, next week, I'm gonna send you uh, a, a little uh, four page uh, handout that we have at the church, because we, we believe that God still gives us gifts and it's important for us to understand our gifts and to know which gifts we particularly have to use in doing God's work. And then Paul sketched one of the one of the characteristics of Paul's letters was he would tend to lay out 
sort of here's what I believe in the first part of the letter, and then there was what scholars call the therefore section. On the basis of what I've just told you I believe, you need to live this way. And so in Ephesians, he does that. He sketched how Christians live. And some of his, his language in that kind of makes us uncomfortable because he followed a form, a literary form that scholars call the household code. We find it in Roman and Greek writing and Jewish writing. Um, Paul did something different with it. The Romans and the Greeks and the Hebrews tended to, def to write the household code to say the husband is the boss, he tells everybody what to do, everybody has to do what he says, and so on. Paul talks in Ephesians, he, he says some things that make us a little uncomfortable. He says, wives, submit to your husbands, but he also says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And he says to husbands, love your wives the way Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. So he took that ancient form, but he uh, used it in ways that were different from the way that uh, the other cultures used it. And finally, when you come to the end of it, uh, in, in chapter six, he talks about put on God's armor. And he actually, <laughs> we, we know because he kept getting arrested and thrown in jail, we know Paul had a good idea how Roman soldiers dressed. And in, in chapter six, when he talks about put on God's armor, he goes through almost piece by piece, put on the helmet of salvation, you know, and put on the shoes of peace and put on the breastplate of righteousness and so on, describing the different pieces that would have been part of a Roman soldier's armor and using them as another metaphor for the kind of disciplined life that he was calling his Christian converts to lead. So the letter to the Ephesians is, is, a, uh, is a beautiful little letter and, and one that teaches us a lot. Then, um, as I said, from Ephesus, he went back to Jerusalem to touch base. So sailed across the ocean, down to Jerusalem, gave a quick report to the apostles there about all the, all the churches he'd established and so on, and then uh, traveled back up to Antioch in Syria, uh, which seems to have become almost kind of a headquarters uh, for him when he wasn't on the road. Uh, we get a little side note, again, back in Ephesus, about a man named Apollos. And this is kind of an interesting one. This guy, Apollos, had come originally from Alexandria in Egypt. And, and of course, Egypt is clear down here somewhere. And Alexandria was another ancient center of Jewish learning. So uh, Apollos was a, an educated man, apparently quite an eloquent man, uh, an impressive speaker. When we get to the Corinthian letters, we find that some people in Corinth thought he was a better preacher than Paul was. Um, and he's preaching in Ephesus, and he meets Paul's friends, Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife. And uh, it turns out that Apollos doesn't know anything about the Holy Spirit yet. He hasn't been exposed to kind of the full range of what Christians were understanding about God. And so Luke tells us that Aquila and Priscilla taught Apollos more fully about the faith. And he was like, oh, well, that's good. Now, I'm, now I know more. Now I'm better equipped to preach about Jesus. And then Apollos goes over to Corinth. And so we get this little sidelight. One of the important things there, and I, I tend to highlight these things just because some people don't understand this. Uh, people think Paul was against women having a role to play in the church. Uh, I've already pointed out some places that, um, that seem to indicate otherwise. This is another one of those. Uh, he says, Aquila and his wife Priscilla took this guy, Apollos, under his wing and taught him. And it doesn't say, and Paul said, how dare you? A woman can't teach a man. Um, so um, anyway, uh, Priscilla plays an important role in, in showing us that. Okay, so that's the second missionary journey. And with that, um, it will be uh, your chance to talk. So here's, here's one question for you. Athens was sophisticated and educated and full of philosophers. Corinth was crude, a wide open seaport, full of people whose living came from catering to sailors on shore leave. Paul was able to bring the message of Jesus winningly and persuasively to people in both of those cities. So I want you, and again, we come from lots of different places in this class. That's one of the advantages of being online. Think about which community Athens or, or Corinth has more in common with whatever place it is you live. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't even, 
well, that'd just be an interesting discussion. Are we more like Athens or more like Corinth? Um, how can all of us learn from Paul as we seek to share the message of Jesus with our neighbors? And, and even within neighborhoods, of course, you can have both Athens neighborhoods and Corinth neighborhoods, even in one town. So that's one point of discussion. But the other thing is, Ephesians said Jesus broke down the wall of hatred that separated Jews and Gentiles. And, and this is an interesting thing. Archaeologists have found in Jerusalem, there was an actual wall in the temple of Jerusalem that separated what they called the court of the Gentiles from the real part of the temple. And, and there was a sign on it that archaeologists have found that basically said, you know, in rather warning terms, no Gentiles pass this wall. May have even said on pain of death, I, I, I'm not sure, but you know, it was like this very physical, visible symbol, uh-uh, only us Jews can come in farther than this. You Gentiles have to stay out there. So there was an actual wall. When Paul says Jesus broke down the wall of hatred, he was playing off the reality of the temple. Having said that he broke down the wall of hatred that separated Jews and Gentiles, just discuss what barriers does Jesus need to break down in our world? And how can you, how can we as a Christian community help Jesus break down those barriers? So Katie, get us out to our breakout rooms. We'll take about 12 minutes here. on this wall in the temple. Do you have a, a photograph of I it? I do not. Uh, I've read about it and, and, and so on, but I've not actually seen a picture of it. I, I assume I that the person who wrote about it wasn't lying. <laughs> right, right. So. Hmm. All right. Well, Katie and I were just talking. We're going to wait a couple of weeks. We're going to be reading the Corinthian letters, and, and we're going to figure out how to do a poll on this thing, and we're going to just take a poll of the class to find out how many Corinths we have people living in and how many Athens we have people living in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, should, I should have thought of that uh, earlier <laughs> before tonight's class, but anyway, <laughs> that'll be fun. Okay, so um, after uh, then, after Paul is uh, rested up, he sets off on his third missionary voyage, and this time he does it, an interesting thing. And, and again, Luke, is it's really interesting. He, he just kind of says, Paul traveled through Galatia, and dismisses that in, in a very few words, and then tells us that he came to Ephesus again. And this time, um, you know, he stayed in Ephesus for two very eventful years, and a bunch of stuff happened in this second stay in Ephesus, maybe in addition to, if my guess is correct, Luke getting the Christmas story. Uh, first of all, um, following up on, remember the story about Apollos, he didn't know yet about the Holy Spirit. Well, when Paul gets to Ephesus, he meets another group there, and he says that they were, they, they, they considered themselves, uh, you know, uh, not just a regular part of the Jewish community, but he says they only knew John's baptism. And that's really kind of striking. Uh, when we read the Gospel of John, uh, you might have noticed in the early section of that, that there are a couple of places where John makes a real point of saying that John the Baptist said to messengers who were sent to him, no, 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 I'm not the Messiah. But it appears from this record in Ephesus and, and the way that John writes in his Gospel that there were some people who still you know, had had uh, listened to John the Baptist preach and had felt that they were followers of him who hadn't moved on to become followers of Jesus. And so uh, Paul meets this group of people who only knew John's baptism. 
And again, he explains to them about the Holy Spirit and, and baptizes them into the full kind of Christian faith and then the Holy Spirit, uh, they receive the Holy Spirit and so on. Uh, then we also read about the fact that a whole bunch of the Christian converts uh, had practiced sorcery. This was one of the things about the, the culture in, in Ephesus and, uh, and in a lot of Greek cities. And after they became followers of Jesus, it says they took all of their, their scrolls and their, maybe their papyrus books about sorcery and took them out and burned them. Now, generally, and especially after what the Nazis did in Germany, book burning is not always considered a, a, uh, an admirable activity. But in this case, you know, they were taking these things about sorcery and burning them as a way of saying, we aren't part of that anymore. We don't do that. We're now followers of Jesus. And, and one of the things that is important to remember is none of those were paperback books. There were no cheap books in, in New Testament times because every book had to be a hand, hand copied production. Um, you couldn't, you know, there were no copy machines. There were no printing presses, none of that. So the fact was, and, and, um, and, and, and Luke even kind of wrote about the fact, this was, this was expensive. This was really, um, you know, something that they were making a sacrifice um, they collected their sorcery texts and burned them publicly. The value of those materials was calculated at more than someone might make if they worked for 165 years, or more literally, 50,000 silver drachmas. And a drachma was, was typically uh, one day's wages for a workman. 50,000 of those was the value of, of these sorcery texts. That they, so this was a real financial sacrifice indeed for these people to make. They, they didn't just turn around and say, okay, let's just sell them to somebody else who wants to know about sorcery. They said, no, we don't do that anymore. We don't believe in it. We don't follow it. And so they destroyed the materials, which is quite a remarkable um, testimony to the impact that uh, their faith in Jesus was having on them. And then finally, uh, as Paul continued to preach and, and make Christians and the Christian community continued to grow, uh, one of the big trades in the city of Ephesus was there were a lot of silversmiths there, and they made images of the goddess Artemis, uh, also sometimes known as Diana. Um, and this was just a major source of income in Ephesus, was selling figures, silver figures, of this Greek goddess, this one Greek goddess, to people uh, in town who wanted one for their house and wanted to, one to put up on the mantle, you know, or, you know, probably gave them sometimes as graduation gifts or something. But also as visitors came from other towns, you know, they could get a, a statue of the goddess to take home with them. And now again, as, as Paul was spreading the Christian faith, um, in the same way that people were getting rid of their sorcery texts, uh, people either were getting rid of their um, images of, of Artemis or not buying them in the first place. So the silversmith's business was down. The economy was, was being hurt in their view. Their trade was being hurt by the spread of this Christian faith that didn't worship this goddess. And therefore, uh, eventually these silversmiths got together and, and started a riot and kind of appealed to civic pride. They got a bunch of people chanting, great is Diana of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, you know, this is our hometown goddess kind of thing. And then and, uh, and they're, and they're grabbing the Christians and, and you know, beating them up and, and, and attacking them. And, and so it's, it's, you know, it's a problem. And the Roman authorities are sending the soldiers out to try to deal with the riot. In the middle of that story, there, there is this interesting little insight that, uh, to me, about the way that Paul approached his ministry. This riot is going on, and he approaches the authorities, and he says, wow, look at that crowd out there. Could I go out and talk to them? <laughs> he doesn't see it as a dangerous thing. He sees it as a chance to maybe get people to listen to him talk about Jesus. 
um, it doesn't work. The Roman authorities are like, no, 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 they're, they're already mad enough at you. We aren't going to send you out to talk to them. You know? It's like, no. But, but the very fact that he, would, it, that he would view it that way, that he would approach it that way, to me says something kind of remarkable about the, the, the vision he had for his ministry and, and the, the courage and determination with which he pursued it. So he has these two very eventful years in Ephesus with lots of this stuff going on. And then he, he leaves Ephesus and he goes back over to Macedonia and Greece uh, and uh, visits Corinth and visits Berea and visits Thessalonica and then kind of swings back, goes up to Philippi. And we know particularly from his letters that, but a little bit from Acts too, he was pursuing a project that again was really important to the apostle because he was taking up a collection from all of these Gentile churches, and he was going to take that to the Jerusalem Christians who were suffering from persecution and maybe from a drought or something in that area. They, they were suffering and they were, you know, really in, in hard, difficult conditions. Um, in the, his second letter to the Corinthians in particular, Paul wrote uh, about this collection and, and um, that's going to be like bonus reading because our book doesn't actually cover Second Corinthians, but I'm going to give you some bonus reading from it anyway. Uh, that'll be one of your giraffe projects uh, for Corinthians week. Um, but this was a really important project to Paul and uh, taking up this collection and, and trying again to, to make it a tangible symbol of the unity between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians. He didn't want them thinking of themselves as, as like these two separate groups, these two rival groups. He was convinced that Jesus had brought them all into one family and, and he wanted them to act like family. And in this case, the Gentiles were still doing relatively well financially. The Jews were, the Hebrew Christians in Jerusalem were having problems. So he wanted to take this offering to Jerusalem to say, listen, you know, your brothers and sisters out in the Gentile world have sent you this help. So he quickly revisits Thessalonica and Philippi. And then um, something rather moving happens. As he's traveling back to Jerusalem, Luke says that he actually didn't go to Ephesus. He, he, he goes back to Troas where he had the vision. He's going down the coastline uh, to making these little stops. But Ephesus, you see, he'd, had, he'd have had to go a little bit inland and Luke says he didn't go to Ephesus because he was in a hurry to get to Jerusalem with the offering. Now that had a, you know, the, the winter months were not good months for sailing across the Mediterranean. So he probably wanted to get there while it was relatively safe to sail. He knew the people in Jerusalem needed the help, but he's also carrying this big sum of money with him. And so that was probably another reason he was kind of in a hurry. I don't just want to dawdle out here while I've got all this money with me. Um, and, and as Luke is writing about this travel, his we reappears. Luke is again a part of the group. And so what he tells us is instead of going to Ephesus, Paul went to this city called Miletus down here, which was on the coast, and he, he, caught, he sent a message asking the elders of the church at Ephesus to come down and meet him here at Miletus. And in Acts 20, we read this really emotional farewell that he has with the elders from the church at Ephesus. He'd spent two years there at the start of this journey. Uh, he'd been there before. Now he, he, he meets with them. He gives them kind of an accounting, if you will, of, he says, I, you know, I have tried to minister honestly with you. I've tried not taken advantage of people. And he says, and I'm, I'm probably never going to see you again. And you know, and it, it talks about how after he talks to them, they, they all are weeping and they, they kneel down to pray with him. And it's a really touching scene to see how much uh, the, he meant to these people and they meant to him. Um, in that, there, there's one other, other interesting thing. In that farewell speech to the Ephesians, uh, he includes, and, and um, this is the only quotation from Jesus that doesn't appear in the four Gospels. That's probably appropriate that Luke is the one who knew about it and included it here. Uh, because Paul, at the end of his speech, says, in everything I have shown you that by working hard, we must help the weak. 
In this way, we remember the Lord Jesus' words, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's actually a pretty well-known saying of Jesus. It gets quoted a lot. It's more blessed to give than to receive. It's not in the Gospels. It's only here in Acts. So, um, and, and then they, they knelt down and they prayed together and they wept and, and he said goodbye to them. He goes on uh, then across the Mediterranean and, and uh, ends up coming down the coastline here on his way to Jerusalem, stops in the city of Caesarea. And Luke tells us that there, there was a prophet and the prophet took the belt of Paul's robe and he tied up his hands and his feet. And he said, you know, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to get arrested. You're going to, you know, they're, they're, it's dangerous. You shouldn't go there. It's a little bit reminiscent of Jesus when he set his face to go to Jerusalem and his followers are saying to him, don't go there. Your enemies are there. And he says, no, I need to go. Paul, in, in Paul's case, it's a little more puzzling because on the one hand, Jerusalem is still kind of the certainly the city of origin of the faith, but he isn't specifically going there to, to get crucified. And so, you know, you kind of have this question, did Paul ignore the Holy Spirit? Did the Holy Spirit want him not to get in trouble in Jerusalem? And did Paul, you know, um, decide that he stubbornly wanted to get the offering there and he wanted to take it himself? Or did he draw boldness from the Spirit leading him? To, or did he do both? It's a little hard to understand what Acts tells us about it, um, but he does go on to Jerusalem. And when he gets to Jerusalem, uh, we read in Acts 21, um, he, first of all, the, the Christian leaders meet him and they say, now, you know, a lot of people here in Jerusalem know that you've been preaching to Gentiles out there and, and they're kind of upset that you're teaching them to ignore the law and stuff. So, you know, why don't you take a vow and fast and, and do some things? And Paul says, okay, fine. I got no problem with that. But one day he goes to the temple and his enemies see him and they assume that he brought one of those Gentile associates from his travels with him into the temple. And they start yelling out, help, help, a man's brought a Gentile into the temple. This enemy of, of the faith has brought this man into the temple. And the specific charge was wrong. Paul was trying to be very careful not to offend the Jewish people. So he had not brought one of his Gentiles past that wall that said they weren't supposed to come in there. But his enemies were ready to believe the worst in general terms. They, they were like, he's abandoned the faith and he's preaching to Gentiles and all of this. So this riot breaks out around the temple and the Romans, ever vigilant, uh, especially in Jerusalem, which was kind of like a powder keg, uh, took him into what we would call probably their protective custody. They arrested him and um, and, and, you know, put him in jail just to keep him from being torn up by the mob. So th this section of, of Acts then has Paul on trial. Um, in Acts 22, uh, he's taken before the Jewish council and he gives a defense there. Uh, and that in Acts 25, and, and one of the things, Remember, Paul was born in that city of Tarsus, and so he was actually a Roman citizen. He'd used it in Philippi uh, when they'd put him in jail, and they were trying to just quietly get him out of town. And he, he, he says, wait a minute, you arrested and beat a Roman citizen. And they were like, uh-oh, because Roman citizens had rights that other people didn't have, um, including the fact that, that it was against Roman law to crucify a Roman citizen. Um, and you couldn't beat them and you couldn't do some of the things you could do to other people. So Paul used that in a couple of instances to say to the Roman authorities, now listen, don't forget, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't beat me. You can't do this and that. When we get to chapter 25, uh, the Jews are trying to get him sent back to Jerusalem because they figure that's where they'd have the crowd on their side. And Paul doesn't want to go back. He knows that that would be like a, a stacked jury and there'd be a lot of violence in the air and stuff. And so he finally says, I appeal to Caesar, and every Roman citizen had that right. And that means he's going to be sent to Rome as a prisoner. Now, the interesting thing is a little later than one of the kings listening to his defense says, well, this guy hadn't done anything wrong. If he hadn't appealed to Caesar, we could let him go. But now the die is cast and Paul is going to Rome. And in some ways, that's just as well, because again, he didn't want to be in a situation. Acts 23 gives us this insight. It says there was a group of Jews in Jerusalem 
um, formulated a plot and solemnly promised that they wouldn't eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 people were involved in the conspiracy. We get this tiny little hint of a family. In, in Acts 23, 16, Paul's sister, oh, Paul had a sister? <laughs> Paul's sister had a son who heard about the ambush, heard about the plot, and he came to the military headquarters and reported it to Paul. And Paul called for one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to report to him. So, you know, we know nothing else about this family connection. Paul had a sister. Her son heard about the plot. He told Paul about it. Paul said, no, don't tell me. Tell the Romans. They so he tells the Romans. And the Romans take Paul by night and get him up to Caesarea. And so the plot fails. Now, the interesting thing is Luke gives us no report. And, and this isn't just me. I've seen very serious theologians like N.T. Wright say, we wish Luke had told us how long those plotters stuck to their vow not to eat uh, before they gave up since they hadn't killed Paul. But anyway, the plot was foiled by this family connection that kind of comes out of nowhere and, and we wish we knew more about. And so, as I said, Paul avoids this biased Jerusalem trial by appealing to Caesar. And so that takes us then to essentially what, at least according to the book of Acts, is, is Paul's last voyage. Um, and so he's, you know, he's originally being held uh, down here in the prison in Caesarea and, and they start moving him up the coast. Again, they, it was dangerous to sail out in the open sea if they could avoid it. And it's getting late in the year. And so he ends up over on the island of Crete and they had gone there on his first missionary voyage a little bit. No, it was Cyprus, I think. Anyway, he ends up on Crete and the, and the captain of the ship says, I think we can make it. So they take off on this long stretch over here's the boot of Italy, you can see, but this storm blows up. And you know, these, these, I mean, there were no motors. These were sailing ships or rowing ships. And, and uh, the storm, you know, just, uh, they're, they're, they think they, they're probably going to sink, but eventually they, they, the storm blew them to the island of Malta over here, and they land on the island of Malta. Um, and uh, it's a great relief, and Paul kind of keeps all the prisoners together and, and doesn't get the commander in trouble. And so then um, finally, uh, Paul had wanted to go to Rome. He would wanted to go as a free man, but as a prisoner, they move their way up through uh, Italy until they come to Rome. And, and if Athens was, was a big deal, coming to Rome obviously was a huge deal. It was the capital of the empire. And so Paul meets uh, with people in Rome and preaches about Jesus to them. Now, now there's one interesting thing. Here's how the book of Acts ends. Paul lived in his own rented quarters for two full years and welcomed everyone who came to see him. Unhindered and with complete confidence, he continued to preach God's kingdom and to teach about the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's why that's interesting, and, and it didn't dawn on me until, you know, a few years ago. By, based on everything that scholars can determine about when the Gospel of Luke was written and Acts was written after the Gospel of Luke, um, Paul must have been dead for at least 10 to 20 years by the time that the book of Acts ended. But Luke, as he wrote it, did not choose to end it by saying, and then the Romans beheaded Paul. And, and the more I've thought about it, I think that that was in a very intentional, almost like a literary thing. It, I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't lying. Paul spent some time in house arrest there preaching about Jesus before the emperor finally decided, okay, we got to get rid of this Christian. I think Luke wanted to end it with the picture of Paul preaching Jesus because that was what had defined the man. And, um, and so I think it's very interesting that he didn't, you know, just, it, he wasn't just blindly putting down facts. He was trying to give us a picture of who this great apostle was and how he administered. And so he ends up with this picture of him still unhindered, preaching Jesus boldly. 
the mark of discipleship for our lesson says disciples witness to others in order to lead them to Jesus Christ. And Paul was probably maybe the supreme example in all of history of somebody who did that. And so he gives us a, a model that we can follow. So that's the book of Acts. Next week, then, we are going to read the, it's, it's not the first chronologically, but it's the first one in, the, in our printed Bibles. We're going to read and, and this awesome letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome before he ever got there as a prisoner. At the time he wrote Romans, he was probably in Corinth, and he had not yet gotten to Rome. But he wrote this just uh, amazing masterpiece that we call the letter to the Romans. So your reading assignments are to read Romans next week, 16 chapters. And um, N.T. Wright uh, has another video clip explaining how what Paul was preaching pushed back against, against a whole different kind of good news that the Roman Empire was preaching. Uh, it's a really well done thing. There is a sales pitch at the end, so just ignore that if you wish to. Um, and then the Bible Project, which we looked at some of their previous uh, videos, it actually took them two videos to cover all of Romans. They broke it up into two chunks, two eight minute chunks. So they, they cover chapters one through four, and then they cover chapters five through 16. And they do a good job of giving you a picture of the whole kind of structure of this letter to the Romans. Again, I'll send you these links uh, before class next week. And uh, again, next Tuesday night is election night. And if you want to be here from 6.30 to 8 Central Time, um, I think there'll still be some election news to watch after that. But if you want to watch the election news, we will be recording the class and, and uh, we will send it to all of you. So either way it works, um, that will be fine. But uh, that's it for this week. And it's great to see all of you. I thank you for your attention and your participation. And next week, it gets really good because, boy, these letters of Paul are just fabulous, uh, fabulous things to read and to learn from and to think about. And, uh, and so anyway, blessings to you. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Night, everybody. Happy voting. Thanks, Carol.